right, if everybody can kind of be finding a seat, I know we love talking and fellowship is fantastic, but we, we've got a uh, book of the Bible to try to finish tonight, Acts chapter 20, or this morning, not tonight, this morning, Acts chapter 28 is where we're at today, and uh, we are in a part of the story that so oftentimes we rush through, which is this shipwreck that Paul endures And yet there is so much interwoven into that shipwreck theologically that we miss, I think, sometimes. And so uh, we're going to jump into it. Lindsay, I hope you're doing well. Doing well? Uh, You getting together with family this weekend? Uh, We are doing all kinds of fun things, and you'll have to ask my wife what that schedule actually looks like, and I answer that question for you. I got you. I got you. June. June's the one that does our social calendar as well. (laughs) I have to. I have to ask her what's going on now. I know I'm teaching this class this morning. You are teaching the class this morning. Absolutely. After that, we'll see. Uh, You know, the worst part is, and and if some of y'all want to stay for the second service, uh, David, uh, of course, led singing at the first service. I'm going to lead those two songs at the second service. Mm. And uh, the elders decided the easiest way to run everybody off from the second service was to have me lead singing and preach. So, you think that'll do it? You might want to just lead communion and pray also. Oh, do all, yeah, 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 okay. the whole thing. All right. Uh, We are in Acts, uh, the last two chapters. We're actually into chapter 28 this morning. And what it is, is the story of Paul going from uh, Jerusalem over to Rome which of course was this very perilous journey that leads to a shipwreck. Uh, He left, like I said, from uh, Jerusalem, went up to Caesarea, went to Sidon, uh, sailed up into southern, what is today modern-day Turkey, dropped down around Crete, and of course at Crete they made the terrible decision to try and make it from uh, basically fair havens over to Phoenix, thought they could do that very short little uh, trip. Phoenix was a much better harbor. And God said no. And they were driven for two solid weeks out into the Mediterranean storms so bad that it says they didn't see moon at night or sun during the day. And seasick probably didn't even begin uh, to say it. Uh, You ever been seasick, Lindsay? I haven't. That's what I was was saying last week. I have not, uh, you know, I've been on boats and things before, but not on anything like like a deep sea or or sailboat or anything like that. Yeah, I can't imagine being on the Mediterranean in a fierce storm in those small boats, a boat that would probably be no longer than the auditorium here. Uh, And so if you could imagine something like that. They eventually get near Malta, and there's where the ship runs ashore, just to the south of Italy. And so here we are, just very quickly, fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks. They dropped four anchors from the stern. They're hearing noises. These are sailors. Uh, They listen. They hear waves hitting rocks. They're like, okay, we know we're close to land. They can't see it. And so they drop these anchors. They're waiting for daylight in an attempt to escape from the ship. The sailors decide, we need to get in the lifeboat and get out of here. This ship's fixing to come apart. And so they're getting ready. They're pretending that they're going to lower some anchors from the bow. Paul tells the centurion and his group of soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. And so the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. And Lindsay, can you imagine being one of the sailors watching that ship drift into the darkness? No, I can't, but I I think at some point you've got to realize if you're on that ship with Paul that he, you might want to listen to him. Yeah. And so surely they're, they're now saying, hey, nothing's gone right so far. And, and what he says is, is happening and is true. We might want to think about listening to him. And we're going to see this develop even further over the next few verses. And so this chapter ends with cutting loose the anchors. They left them in the sea. Uh, and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind. And they headed for the beach. They saw the beach. Sun's coming up. They see the beach. And they're heading for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move. The stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. I mean, it's looking bad. Mm -hmm. And now the big question happens. What does the centurion and the soldiers do? Because you've got prisoners. Prisoners are chained very likely to one another. And now the question is, 
Uh, do you unchain them so that they can swim? Do you leave them chained and let them drown? Or you go ahead and put them out of their misery and kill them now? And, and so they, they plan to kill them because they don't want them to escape. Because, by the way, if you had a prisoner and you let, let him escape, guess what happened? Your life or his life. That's how serious they were about guards. You let someone get away, your life for their life. But the sin. Yeah, Paul, yeah. yeah. Paul's constantly intervening here. Notice here. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life, kept them from carrying out their plan, and then everyone basically jumps out of the boat. And if you can imagine jumping out of a boat, you're weak, you're tired, you've only eaten the night before. Paul finally got you to eat something. Two solid weeks of seasickness, and now you go into the cold waters. you got to remember, it's, it's uh, late November, early December, and it's cold. And they're jumping into the water, but notice the last phrase. In this way, everyone reached land safely. And so they walk up onto the beach, and Lindsay, I'm going to let you take it from here. This is a great story. Well, I was, I was waiting. I was sitting here thinking while you were talking that um, when you had talked about reenacting this, this scene right here. By the way, every time I see Joe come by like this, I think of the Three Stooges and them getting... Y'all remember that episode of the Three Stooges? I mean, where they're coming through the hospital as they're made up as doctors, you know, and they're in the carts and everything. One, two, and... Yeah, yeah okay, all right. Let's see the third one. What were we talking about? Uh, you're, you're on, you, you were you, about to pull out a snake. That's what, no, never mind. Um, so, it, so they get to, to Malta, um, and I, I, the islanders, I, I was trying to figure out, you know, what is, what is this, this group of people that they run into? You know, what, how would you describe them? Do you have any idea? Yeah, in, in, in study that I saw, they were a mixture of Phoenicians and Carthaginians. Carthage is just south of here in North Africa. You know, Carthage was one of the great cities of the ancient world. And uh, Hannibal, I don't know how many of you remember the name Hannibal, but Hannibal was a general from Carthage, and, and the Carthaginians and the Romans were constantly in war with one another. Mm -hmm. And so after Rome conquered Carthage, a lot of the Carthaginians settled in Malta and basically intermarried with a lot of the Phoenicians who had been kind of the original people there. So it's a mixture of, of very cultured people, mm -hmm. uh, but a very small island. We'll talk about that more here in a second. Yeah, because we're getting, uh, like you said, we're in the winter months, and of course they're coming out of the water, they're freezing cold, they've, they've, they're probably, even though they've had something to eat, they're probably you know, just physically distressed as far as just their health, what they've been at sea for two weeks. And it, they're freezing cold. Uh, who knows what kind of clothes they have to change into? And it's raining. And yeah, <laughs> and and uh, and they build a fire. They, again, we can relate to this. We drug a bunch of branches at my house yesterday to our fire pit in the back. Um, building a fire with the warmth of that brings, and and kind of uh, the way it makes you feel after you've been freezing cold, and and what that would do to just your whole body, and and uh, really just your health, your overall health of, of getting you warm. And, and Paul jumps in. By the way, this is a picture of Malta. Uh, where's Clyde at? Clyde in here? There's Clyde. Uh, Clyde said he took this picture of Malta when he was over there, and they told him this was the motel that Paul stayed in when they were there. Well, maybe Clyde didn't say that, but this is a picture of Malta. By the way, that's the sunrise. That's not the sunset. That's the sunrise. And uh, uh, here, by the way, is Malta. And Malta is a little bitty island. Uh, Malta's size is one quarter the size of Sumner County. So if you know how big Sumner County is, Malta is one quarter the size of Sumner County. It is one of the densest populated nations. It's a nation all to itself. So if you can imagine a nation a quarter of the size of Sumner County with a half a million people. So take the number of people in Davidson County, put them in a quarter of the size of Sumner County, and you have the nation of Malta today. And so uh, very, very small island. 
uh, 10 or 12 miles long, 7 or 8 miles wide is all it is. And so, uh, and if you'll notice up here, St. Paul's Bay, uh, this is where it's believed that they ran aground. Uh, and, and by the way, nearly, nearly all of the scholars uh, believe that, that that is accurate. That based on what Acts says and what that particular bay has, that it's named St. Paul's Bay accurately. That that's where they came ashore. So as he's, as he's helping with the fire, and I love the fact that he is helping. He didn't just come aground and, and, uh, and just let them take care of him. He's helping put the fire, and, and a snake comes up and, uh, and fastens itself to his hand. Um, and, of course, they think that because he's a prisoner that he must have been a murderer. He must have done something wrong. And so the, the gods are, are lashing out against him to kill him because that's what his fate is, um, that he's, that he's going to be killed. And they say, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. That's a very appropriate name yeah. uh, of, of a god that would uh, be the one that judges. Uh, so Justice is the one that is making sure that he, he dies through all of this. Uh, do you like snakes? You know, with, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I got a phone call on a Friday night, actually a picture, and it was... Um, I read the, the caption, and it said, look what was in the school. And the custodians, when they were cleaning the building on Friday night, turned the corner, and there was a snake going down the hallway. I thought school was out. Well, oh. school was out. <laughs> and so the person cutting the grass came in and was getting a drink of water and got rid of it. But it turns out my chorus teacher had a snake in a cage in his room, and it had gotten out of the cage and was going, slithering through the middle of the hallway. Those custodians were not very happy. They freaked out in Spanish. Freaked so out in Spanish. Yeah. So I don't know what they said, but I got a caption. I got a caption and a, a good picture of them seeing the snake. They, they ran the other way. Yeah. My, my only experience ever with, with, with uh, grabbing a snake was one time my dad and I were going fishing, and we uh, had night crawlers there in North Mississippi. You could go out to the woods if you knew where to look and move the leaves around, you'd find night crawlers. And we used them for, the, for bait. And I remember one time being out with my grandparents getting night crawlers, and we're out there, and Dad's raking the leaves, and grab that one, grab that one. And, and I looked at one, and I said, Dad, is that a night crawler? Because it was awful big. And Dad said, yes, grab it. And I grabbed it and pulled it up. And as soon as I pulled it up, he said, snake, snake. And so, uh, yeah, it didn't latch onto my hand, but I let go of it very quickly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm not real good at, uh, with snakes. And, yes, sir. today. Uh, that's one of the interesting things about uh, scholars is they'll say, what kind of snake was this? But you need to realize that Malta is nothing like the island. What, what Clyde visited a few years ago is not the island of Paul's day. Uh, now, uh, you know, it's been 2,000 years. Uh, a lot of humans have come in. And we humans are really bad about what? We kill everything. You know, we, we, we want to get rid of all the snakes. I mean, uh, I don't know about y'all. I don't know the last time y'all I saw a snake. Uh, you know, I, if there's, there, I'm sure there's snakes in Davidson County and Sumner County, especially the more rural areas. But 
you know, you just don't see the snakes that you used to see. And it's because we're scared of them. We kill them. I know I do. I mean, I think it's against the law to kill snakes. But uh, last year we were in West, western Arkansas and June had gone running one morning. And she looked and for the first time saw a huge rattlesnake. And it came across the sidewalk where she was running. And so uh, that was the last time she ran that week. But anyway, all right. Look at what Paul does. He shakes it off into the fire. And everybody's watching. They know he's going to swell up. Uh, Curtis, you was talking about that snake you saw. Uh, when I was a teenager, we were picking up firewood one time, and, and our dog started barking at something in the leaves down on the side of the hill. And the next thing I know, uh, the dog jumps, and a copperhead is latched onto his nose. And uh, it's a small copperhead, and he throws it off, and Daddy kills it. But that dog's nose swollen, it sw swelled, swelled, swollen. We got any English teachers in here? Swelled? Swelled. All right. Let's just say it got twice the size of its normal. They're expecting Paul to do the same thing. They're expecting him to start swelling up, which is what you do if it's a viper. And, and nothing happened. And then they were convinced, at first, he's a criminal. Mm -hmm. Now, he's a god. Yep. And watch what happens as a result of it. Yeah, and, and so um, they end up, this, this Publius, what do you think? Pu Publius, Publius. Pu Publius. What do you call it? I, I don't know. I read an A there. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm going to go with whatever you just said. Uh, the chief official of the island welcomed him to home and showed general hospitali generous hospitality for three days, and they end up uh, they end up staying for several months through this winter season. And um, uh, you it, know, it, it, let, let me go back. I did put in here a uh, uh, tree of life version, uh, one that Rodney had a student that I think was on that committee that translated that. I think you told me, Rodney, that's that uh, uh, Messianic Jewish translation that came out, or at least. He sent you a copy of it. Uh, Rodney gets all this free stuff that I don't get. And I'm like, why does Rodney get all this free stuff? That's because he's taught so many of these students. But notice here now in the vicinity around that place was lands belonging to the most prominent man of the island. Uh, some translations translate uh, Publius as the governor. Uh, it's probably more simply be, means that he is one of the wealthiest persons around. Mm -hmm. He's a very influential citizen. And so he welcomes them, and then what and then does he, he do? And then, and then his father is sick. And so it, they, they've now seen what, what's going on with Paul. And again, Paul, Paul takes advantage of these situations that he's in, and he sees opportunities to minister to people that are around him that probably would never have this opportunity unless Paul would have had a shipwreck into this island. And so he ends up, he, um, the father is suffering from fe fever and Terry, and Paul goes and sees him and places his hand on him and heals him, and then the rest of the sick on the island come and are cured. And, and I want you to think about what would have happened in an island as far as their opinion of Paul when Paul heals all the sick. Mm -hmm. I want you all to think about that. I mean, uh, Larry Graham here is one of our wonderful mi uh, ministers. I'm going to call you a minister, Larry. Larry, uh, along with Wayne Gleason, takes care of a lot, a lot of our benevolent needs. And one of the things you hear from people all the time is thank you. This church is so generous. This church is so kind. This church has helped us so much. And, and Larry and Wayne are, are a big reason that we get a lot of people in our community who appreciate the Hendersonville Church Christ because of what we do in helping people. And when you help people, man, you create goodwill. And boy, the amount of goodwill. Notice the text here. They honored us in many ways and when we were ready to sail they furnished us with the supplies we need I mean here they are bringing gifts to Paul and to Luke and to Aristarchus and very likely to the centurion and the soldiers you see the centurion by his rank could have gotten you know basically taxed the people and said y'all need to you know give us supplies he doesn't have to do that because of what Paul has done, as far as goodwill on the island, everybody is just generously given, and now they head out after three months. And by the way, the three months here, 
puts us basically near the end of February, early March. I don't know if you read anything that gave us a, a closer date than that. No, I think that's about right. Yeah, so, so it's, it's now late February, early March. It's, uh, spring is, is about there. And, and by the way, in this area over here, uh, spring gets there quicker than it does here in the United States. Uh, I went to Israel uh, three years ago in February expecting it to be cold. No, no, Israel, uh, February in Israel, 70 degrees. And by the way, you go down to the Dead Sea, it's 90 degrees in February. And so, it, yeah, so, so uh, it gets really hot. Rodney can tell you how hot in the summertime. Rodney, I mean, what, what have been some of your... 117 in February. Woo! At the Dead Sea. Okay. But Rodney, you've done archaeological work over there in the summertime, and I can't imagine how hot it is. And of course, it depends on which part of Israel you're in. Because up Galilee is very different than down in Judea, and then of course you go down in the desert to Judea, very different than it is in the northern part of Judea. So after three months, we put out the uh, ship uh, that had wintered in the island, and it was an Alexandrian ship, same kind of ship that they had lost, one carrying grain. So again, it's a ship that had very likely weathered, wintered there. And notice with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. Uh, these gods are the gods of truth. And, and so it, uh, one of the commentaries I read said that Luke may have been mentioning these gods simply as a way of saying, isn't it interesting that the man who's telling the truth gets on a ship that has, you know, committed to these two gods of Castor and Pollux. And by the way, they're twins. Uh, they're, they're not, uh, I don't know how to say this. According to Greek legend, one of them was fathered by Zeus and one of them was fathered by a human. And yet they're twins somehow. And you go, how in the world did that happen? I don't have a clue. Okay, isn't but isn't that's it interesting Greek legend. How, he, how he weaves these names of gods into his narrative? Justice, yeah. Castor, Pollux, almost to Justice. say, almost to say, hey, I know this is what you all believe, but look at the real story that's happening. You know, that I know you all think that Justice is doing these things, and that Castor and Pollux are are the gods of truth, and and all these things. But look, look who the real God is. Look at the followers of the way that are doing the will of God, and look how things are working out for them. Yeah. All right, I've saved this part for you. Okay. Yeah. All right, so anyway, they're down here on Malta. If you'll notice in the map right here, this is Malta, uh, just south of Italy. They're going to head up and uh, basically make three different ports until they finally get just south of Rome. And so you can take it from here. Yeah, and so they, they put in at Syracuse, which I can say pretty easily. I don't have to worry about the pronunciation there unless you've got some. No, Syracuse okay, is good. good. Good, And stayed there, and they set sail, arrived at Aragium, and then they, the south wind came. And again, as we talked about already, we're, we're going into the springtime, so the, the sailing is going to be, because I'm a sailing expert, it's going to be so much better in the springtime than You're it was. You're a sailing expert? I am now, after two weeks of this, so okay. um, I'm, I know all about my winds now. Um, they found some brothers and sisters, invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. And again, I, I just love the fact that Luke's throwing in these little spots that um, they found brothers and sisters, they, they stayed with them. I, I think about staying three, three months on Malta. I think about staying a week with these brothers and sisters, about how much influence Paul and these companions are having on different parts of the world at that time and how they are influencing so many people, even through this difficult time of shipwreck, of imprisonment, of all these things going on, uh, how they're influencing so many people. And, and what's interesting is the centurion is letting him do this. Yeah. I mean, notice there, we put in at Syracuse, stayed there three days. Then, like he said, we go to Regium. The next day on the south wind came up. On the following day, we reached. I noticed you, you didn't pronounce Putioli. I, I, thank you. Yeah. And, and there they found some brothers and, and sisters, and they stayed a whole week. It, it's almost as if the centurion is like, whatever you want. You know, you've saved my life. You've saved the life of my soldiers. Whatever you want. And so he's giving Paul enormous amount of freedom. And then I love, this is part of my favorite part. Yeah, so they, the, the brothers and sisters there had heard that they were coming, and they traveled as far as, as the Forum of Apius and Three Taverns. I love the name of, that, of the town there, Three Taverns, to meet us at the sight of these people 
Paul thanked God and was encouraged. Could you think about this? You think about if you've been gone from this church for months and months and months and months and you've been on a ship and you've wrecked and you've had a snake bite you and you've had handcuffs on and you've had people lording over you've been in multiple trials you've been doing all these things you've you've read from the book of Romans how he said so much I long to see you and then he finally gets to uh, a place where he is um, seeing people of God just think about what kind of feeling that yeah, would be. Yeah, and, and here's what's fascinating is that somehow word had got to Rome. Now, Lindsay, I don't know how that happened. You know, how does, here they are heading that way. I guess that week they stayed uh, there at Pete, uh, Petioli that somebody had, somebody had gone north and told mm -hmm. Paul's just to the south of us. And word had traveled fast. And, and so here comes these people. And by the way, I can't prove this. But one of the couples that is in Rome, that he had sent greetings to in Romans, is Priscilla and Aquila. Now, are they still there? We don't know. But don't you know that if he gets down to the three taverns and he looks up, and here comes his old tent-making friends, Priscilla and Aquila. Don't you know that all at once they're like, wow, this is awesome. You know, look, look at these people who have come out to see me. And, and so they get to Rome, and notice, when we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. I mean, they, yeah, they're, they're like, listen, you're, we're going to let you live over here by yourself. There will be a guard to guard you. And, and you've got to realize, they don't consider Paul a dangerous man. By the way, evidently there's no charges against him. I, I don't know what Festa sent, but I mean, it's like I hate to send somebody to Nero, and I don't even know what the charges are. And so here he is, and uh, they, they, they let him uh, uh, live by himself with a guard, and, and as soon as he gets there, three days later, watch what he does. He calls, he, those, he calls those Jewish leaders. He calls all the Jewish leaders in Rome. This is where it gets weird, mm -hmm. really weird. Watch what he says. He says, when, my, my brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. Same thing he said the whole time. Yeah. He, it's the same narrative. He's never changed that beginning part of what he said, that no charges against me. I've done nothing wrong. In fact, I am actually living out the, the will of the, of the prophets, of the, yeah, of the, Jewish of the people. law. Yeah. If you won't, if you yeah, and, with. and they examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel. There's that little phrase, hope of Israel, that I am bound with this chain. Now, here's what's interesting, though. Paul has made an assumption. Paul assumes the Jews in Rome know about him. He's fixing to be humbled a little bit. You know, every now and then, you need to learn humility. You know, sometimes you think, wow, everybody must know about me. No, a lot of people don't know about you. You know, I still go back to Mississippi, Lindsay, I don't know if you ever do this in West Virginia, but I still go back to Mississippi and, and uh, my mom and dad are both past now, so I don't get down there as much. But I remember going down for my grandmother's funeral several years ago, and, and I got up at the Chapman Church of Christ. Does that sound familiar? Got up at the Chapman Church of Christ, and I preached part of my grandmother's funeral. And as I'm coming out, somebody walked up to me, and they said, All right, so help us with this. You're a preacher? And I said, Yeah. And then I love this one. For a Church of Christ? Yeah, in Nashville, yeah, and then they just kind of like, oh, and I'm like, well, that's great, you know, every, every now and then you need, need a little humility, you know, I mean, I, I tell everybody back, back in Mississippi, I am still H's boy, even though I am now in my 60s, uh, I still remember going down several years ago, my dad's first cousin owned a store, I went in, walked up to him, and his name's Curtis. Sorry, Curtis. Very common name in Mississippi. 
and his name is Curtis. And I said, Curtis, do you know who I am? And he looked at me, and you got to realize, Curtis now is country, really, really country. Uh, he was a dairy farmer for years and years, and he looked at me, and he said, no, I don't know I know you. Who are you? And I said, I'm L.H.'s son. You H's boy? I said, yeah. Well, look at here. H's boy is here. And I'm like, goodness gracious, where have I moved to? You know, I mean, that's just kind of back home for me. Watch what happens to Paul. Here's Paul saying, I didn't do anything wrong. I was arrested. I didn't violate the Torah. I didn't do anything worthy of death. Y'all, I'm not guilty. Watch their response. Yeah, We've not received any letters from Judea concerning you. And none of our people who have come from there have reported or said anything about you. Oh, wait, who are you? I, I'm, I'm Saul of Tarsus. Is that supposed to mean anything to us? Again, it lets you know that when you get away from, from home, you may not be known at all. Are you still known back in West Virginia? Of course, yes. Oh, by, of course. by two or three people. <laughs> oh, by about two or three people. Wait a minute. A, how, many, how many brothers and sisters you've got? Uh, just a few. Okay, people. there yeah. you go. All right. And so, but notice verse 22. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. And so notice the word there used, this sect. Now, you need to remember something. This is somewhere around... I'm trying to think of the date on this one, Lindsay. Uh, 60 AD, maybe something like that, 61 AD, something like that. So it's early 60s. About 13 years earlier, 14 years earlier, Claudius had expelled all the Jews from Italy because of arguments over Christus, over Christos, over Jesus. And so there had been a lot of fights in the synagogues, a lot of riots in the Jewish community over is Jesus the Messiah or is he not the Messiah and so now these Jews have come back so you have Christian Jews back in Rome you have non-Christian Jews back in Rome and there's still a lot of going on with it so here's this Jewish rabbi now a follower of the way and they want to know tell us about it so here we go yeah so they again very similar story. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day. That even larger numbers came to where he was staying. And uh, he witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Which is interesting because that group that welcomed him, you know, we've got those Jewish Christians that right. obviously were, were very welcoming. And then we have this, this bigger group of Jews who are now... Some are convinced, some are not. They obviously have not heard. They knew some of this, but didn't, they, they, as they listened to Paul, some of them said, makes perfect sense. Yeah. Some of them said, no, nah, we don't want anything to do with that. Yeah, and remember, Paul is a master rabbi. Paul is one of the most educated men uh, of that time period. I mean, he'd been trained there in Jerusalem. Uh, he's educated in Greek. I suspect he knew Latin. He knows Hebrew. He knows Aramaic. I mean, this guy is incredibly smart. And he lays out the story. And notice, it was all day. I mean, from morning till evening. I mean, can you imagine an invitation to that gospel meeting? You know, what time does it start? 8 o'clock in the morning. What time does it end? 7 o'clock at night. Uh, I think i got a ball game i got to go to. You know, I mean, that, that's tough. All day long? Yes, all day long. And yet at the same time, I mean, if you're interested in the subject, you do that. I, I, was, I was telling several people, uh, Stan Wilson and I and David Head, I think David's going with us as well and our wives are going. We're flying out two weeks from today to go to uh, Waco, Texas uh, to study the book of Galatians for four days. And people are like, so what are y'all going to be doing in, in Waco? We're going to be studying Galatians. What are you going to do when you're not studying Galatians? We're going to be studying Galatians. I mean, you know, it starts on Sunday night, Sunday night, uh, Monday morning, uh, Monday afternoon, Monday night, Tuesday morning, uh, Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, then we fly back to Nashville. And somebody's like, you want to you wanna study Galatians that bad? Yeah, I love studying Galatians. You know, Rodney, I know you have taught classes that have gone these short courses that people come in there and, man, it's just intensive and you're getting in there and you're learning so much and you're drinking it in and, and, and parts of it is leaking out of your ears. That's what's going on here with these Jews. 
Paul's throwing scripture after scripture after scripture. And they're sitting there thinking, okay, yeah, I remember that scripture. Oh, I've never noticed that scripture. And the end result, some believe and some don't. And then Paul does something really strange. Yeah, he, he um, I love this little quote. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet. He uses the scripture that I'm assuming that they have been discussing all day long about who Jesus the Christ is to also use that scripture to talk about who these people in front of him are. And, and Paul is going to quote a text out of Isaiah that Jesus quoted often. It was one of those texts that when you throw it out there, you better be ready for a fight. I mean, every once in a while, there's a verse, you throw it out, and it's like throwing down the gauntlet. Watch the verse. Notice, when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. What, what do you do if somebody tells you your heart is calloused? You know, I mean, have you ever seen calloused hands? You know, if you've if you ever seen a, someone who plays the guitar or banjo, you know, they got those calluses on the end of their fingers. I never could play the guitar because of that. I mean, it just I, I've tried to learn to play the guitar, and it just hurts my fingers too much. I'm like, man, how do you do that? You've got to develop calluses. Well, here the calluses are on the heart. They hardly hear with their ears. They've closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts in turn, and I would heal them. And so Paul takes a passage that Jesus, by the way, quotes when he's giving his parables on occasions as to why some people hear and some people don't hear. Some people hear because they want to hear. And some people see because they want to see. You know, it's amazing how many blinders we put up. And by the way, this happens in the church just like it does in the world. I, I, I've gone through situations over the years and... I, I, where I would be talking to someone and we'd get on a topic where they've already made up their mind. And if they're already made up your mind, guess what? You're not going to get anywhere. Even though they are, quote, you know, we're going to listen to the Word of God. Well, what about this part of the Word of God? And, and I mean, I've had people literally say to me, well, I'm going to act like I've never seen that verse before. Because they don't want to see the truth. And it just kind of blows my mind when that happens. And, and yet, it's awful hard for us once we develop a belief system to be challenged in that belief system. And, and one of the things I've tried to do, Lindsay, over my years of ministry is to be as open to the Word of God as possible. I know I have blinders. And, of course, y'all know the problem with blinders, don't you? The problem with blinders is you don't know where you're blind. You know, that's the whole problem with blinders. You've got these blinders up. Only problem is you can't see the blinders. And so, as I tell people all the time, I know I have blind spots in Scripture. I just don't know where they are. And, and uh, over the years, that's why it's so tough to preach in a church with someone like Rodney in it, is because Rodney's sitting there going, blind spot, blind spot. <laughs> Especially if I'm quoting Hebrew. You know, Rodney's like, no, not the way you quote that, not the way you pronounce that. You know, and one I try the, to do the best I can. One of the benefits of reading different translations is to sometimes see blind spots. Of, yes. Of one of the challenges when I was back in school, uh, I think the message was fairly new, but one of the assignments we had was read through the gospel, I believe it was Luke, read through the gospel of Luke through the message with where you don't have the, the verses right. and the chapters where you're reading it more as a story. And when I did that, things that I had not seen before, and then you go back and you look, oh, you know, the version I'm used to reading, what does it say there? And, and you find things that maybe you haven't seen before. Yeah, yeah, it's those blind spots. And so th that's basically what Isaiah is saying, is that we as human beings, even as people who believe in God, can have blind spots and not be able to see. And y'all, listen, I know how difficult it is when you've heard something preached the same way for year after year after year after year after year, and then all at once you hear someone come along and preach it slightly different, and you go, ooh, I've never heard that one before. You know, uh, I, I grew up at a time when we never preached on the Holy Spirit. We didn't teach on the Holy Spirit. In fact, I was taught that there was no gift of the Holy Spirit other than the Bible. 
that that was what was to have the, the word of God in you was the indwelling of the Spirit. The sword and, of the Spirit. And when I finally was introduced to the Holy Spirit by teachers, I was like, whoa, where have all of these verses been in my life? And, and the thing is, is that we as preachers can be very selective in what we preach sometimes. And, and that can be a problem. So, all right, our time is about up. Uh, therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. One of the messages of Luke Acts is, why should Gentiles believe in a Jewish Messiah when many of the Jews themselves are rejecting it? goes all the way back to Luke chapter 4 when Jesus went to Nazareth and they rejected him at Nazareth. Why? Because he mentioned Gentiles and the same is happening here at the end. And so Paul decides he's going to proclaim to the Gentiles and the text says for two whole years with all boldness and without hindrance he preached the gospel. So final thoughts? Yeah, what do, I, I, what do you think happens at the end of this story? Well, I know we just got a minute or so, but I, I want to say this just to, as we conclude Acts, and that is, here, here we've just finished this, this history of the establishment of the church. We have the Gospels of the story of Jesus. We've got the, the reaction of the establishment of the church, and then, and then we get into the reaction of the people we just read about through their letters and through their, their, um, their stories. And I, and I started thinking, as, as I was thinking about today as we end this, you know, our, our Christian life is kind of our reaction to their reaction. They had a first-person account of who Jesus was. They lived with him. They saw him. They were converted by him. Uh, or or they, they were very close to him. And so they wrote these, these letters, these, these epistles to others to talk about how you should live as a Christian. And so we've just studied that whole process of establishing Jesus' church and what Christians are doing during this time. And then these, these people, I wrote a few of them down, just, just bear with me just for a minute. Um, people like Paul saying, uh, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of the glory in Christ Jesus. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Talk about James, the leader of the church then, and therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. John, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And then Peter, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Our reaction to their reaction ought to be making us live these lives that are as close to God as possible. The book of Acts was written so that we could understand the story of where we came from, the story of who we are as Christians, the story of, of how we should be uh, trusting God through shipwreck, through snake bites, through, through imprisonment, through good times, through bad times. It, we, ought to be, we ought to be reacting to the way they reacted, through peace and love and gentleness and kindness by receiving the Spirit, letting Him guide us, and by following Jesus Christ. It's not, just a, it's not just a history book. Those things are super important, but it's a book to give us a blueprint of how we should live as 2021 Christians in Hendersonville, Ville, Gallatin, Nashville, Davidson County, Sumner County, Tennessee, United States, the world. We should be putting our imprint as Christians on this world, just like Paul and Peter and John and James and all of these disciples of God did in AD 60. Yeah. It's been an incredible privilege to teach with Lindsay. I, I have uh, followed him uh, ever since he was in college. Uh, Penny, his wife, beautiful family. Lindsay's going to be teaching uh, up above the offices uh, a young adults class. Uh, it's relatives, young 
Young, relative. yes, relative young. Uh, this would be open to anybody who would like to go to it. It's not. It doesn't stand at the door and go, "How old are you?" No, you can't come in. And so uh, we're uh, two of us, along that. with Lee uh, Hickerson here. Lee's going to be over in the kind of the baby boomers, baby busters uh, class next week, and we're all going to be uh, teaching the Sermon on the Mount as we're doing encounters with Jesus in the miracle stories. We're going to be encounters with Jesus uh, in his teaching. So. Uh, whether it's Lee, whether it's uh, Lindsay, or any of the other eight classes we have, please take advantage of them. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time in the wonderful book of Acts. Oh, Father, it has taught us how your people responded in the first century in hopes that we too can respond as well. Bless us, Father, as we seek to be your people.